Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tolman. Welcome back to an episode of Talk Dizzy to Me. I am Dr. Danielle Tolman. I am a vestibular physical therapist and as always joined by my co-host, Dr. Abby Ross, a vestibular physical therapist and neuroclinical specialist. Today, we have two very special guests. We're very excited, of course, to have Jeff Walter back, but today we're also joined by Herman Kingma, and we are going to talk about some really hot topics that we've been dying to have on our show. So um, why don't we jump into just a brief introductions um, with Jeff and Dr. Kingma, and then we'll jump into our questions. Sure. So uh, Jeff Walter, I'm a vestibular physical therapist in central Pennsylvania at Geisinger Medical Center. Um, primarily clinician, a little bit of research, and I also have a teaching interest. Um, if you have interest in further courses, I have courses on MedBridge education primarily, and then I also teach some live courses throughout the year. And uh, my name is Herman Kingma. I'm a professor in uh, vestibular medicine in Maastricht and in Aalborg. Uh, so I, I devoted my life to uh, all the vestibular problems that you can imagine. My background is both in uh, biology and physics and vestibular medicine, so I'm a, a real hybrid. And that helped me a lot, you know, to, on one hand, to understand, try to understand the complaints and the problems of patients. And on the other hand, other hand by technical background, that you can think about solutions. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And Dr. Kimba, can you tell our audience what time it is where you're at right now? <laughs> Uh, it's between 11 and 12 in the evening. So way past. Not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Dr. Kingma. We'll get right into questions. Um, Jeff, you want to kick it off? Sure. So can you explain to our audience what a balance belt is, like how it works and how it may potentially help a patient? Mm -hmm. Well, let me start to say that uh, in 2002, after already 20 years seeing patients with vascular disorders, I was really puzzled by the fact that there were no, there were no prothesis for patients with vascular deficits. You know, if you have a hearing problem, you get a hearing aid or you get a cochlear implant. When you have a visual problem, you get glasses, contact lenses, cataract surgery. And for the vascular system, there's nothing, but you know, I saw the patient that were de desperate, that wanted to have some kind of help. And of course, there were some options like rehab and things like that. It's, it's not bad at all, but there are patients that want to bring it to a higher level. So they were not happy enough with the rehab that they got or the medication. So I thought, why can't we develop something for them? And then I thought about two options that we will discuss today, that is the balance belt and the vestibular implant. So let's stairwise, you know, the most simple solution, a uh, vestibular prosthesis like the balance belt, which, which helps people to, uh, to restore balance and mobility. Now, what is it? Nothing very new, you know, people before me have been using vibration uh, to help people to orient themselves when they are blind or something like that. And they were also using vibration, for example, to train people for rehab. So the idea is basically very simple. You have a sensor that detects where gravity is. And then this information goes into a computer, a mini computer, and that sent pulses that are around your waist. So there are small vibrators around your waist and the vibrators are activated depending on how you move. So for example, when I move forward, I feel a little bit of vibration in the front of my belly. When I move backward, I feel vibration on the back. And when I turn to the right, I feel more vibration there. So if you make a hula hoop, you feel the rotation rotating around your, your waist. Mm -hmm. So what does it do? It, it really um, 
helps you to give extra information via somatosensis, so your feeling, your tactile feeling in your, in your skin, around your belly. It helps you to feel again where gravity is. And that is one of the problems that people with a bilateral vessel loss have. They don't have an accurate detection anymore of gravity with their balance organs. You can still see it and you can still feel it with propiosepsis. But you should realize yourself that the labyrinth is the most fastest detector sensor to detect where gravity is. So you can still see it and feel it, but when the labyrinths do not work, you're much slower. And that's precisely why people without labyrinths need to slow down. And if there's a sudden disturbance of balance, they notice that too late and they are at risk to fall. So if you restore now this, this feeling of balance by this balance belt, this tactile vibration stimulation, then you help your body to feel again better where gravity is. Give you a simple example. Imagine that it's in the night and you have to go to the toilet. So there's no I'm over 50, I can relate. Go ahead. <laughs> so you you you're walking then, you want to walk to the to the toilet, but imagine that you're in a in a hotel, you don't know precisely how everything is. So then you put your hand along the wall and then you have an external reference, the wall where you know, oh, that's the wall, and you can walk towards the toilet and you feel safe. Now, with this balance belt, the balance belt detects where is gravity, and it's a wall that walks with you, something like that. Mm -hmm. And of course, it doesn't prevent you from falling. If you really move, you can move. But it's amazing how it restores your feeling of spatial orientation. And, and that's basically how it works. You don't need to train it. You don't need to to teach it, the system, because it's a natural feeling, like, like touching the wall, that you know already from childhood on how to use that information. And that works with the belt also. I have lots of questions. How precise is it in detecting what vector you're swaying in? Oh, it's a half a degree of uh, accuracy. So it's pretty, uh, pretty precise. Uh, but the, the setting that we use for people is not half a degree. Because if you make it so sensitive, then with every movement, then you get a stimulation or something like that. So you, you, you make uh, some kind of cone of stability uh, in which you can maneuver. But reality is that while you are moving, walking, for example, you're moving so much that generally you're all the time stimulated. Only when you stand still, then the system becomes silent. And when you then slowly turn in one direction, you get constant information that you're tilted. When you make a fast movement, then it auto calibrates. So there, there are all kinds of tricks in it, you know, to make sure that in a normal situation, it gives you subconsciously constant information how you move in space. Would it, does um, it inform me on the velocity that I'm swaying at or just the direction or both? Does that make sense? Both, both. We, we, we use both the, the, the dynamic components, so how the velocity, how fast you move, as well as the angle. And then there is some kind of, uh, we call that hysteresis in the system. That means that, you know, you, you move like this, then it starts to vibrate and it takes some time to go back before it stops vibrating. Otherwise, it starts to oscillate all the time. So there's all kinds of tricks to make it, you know, uh, pleasant while you are walking. Um, on top of that, you know, you have a lot of tactors around your waist and we can stimulate several tactors at the same time. So by that, by that interpolation, by that technique, you are able to really vibrate, stimulate every part of your waist. So 360 degrees 
around it with an accuracy of a, of a, uh, let's say about five degrees maximum. Is this calibrated per each individual's limits of stability? So finding what that cone of security is for them and then setting the calibration for that to vibrate depending on if they start to exceed that cone. And until now, uh, we decided at a certain moment not to do that. We, I've done that in all the research projects. It took me about 20 years to develop it. And then you learn by doing, you know, uh, how, how, how much you need to individualize it. And then we learned that there is some kind of general setting that works out for almost everybody. But I think um, most likely in the future, we will make it possible to adjust it a little bit from person to person. Also the, the intensity of the vibration, for example. Um, this is a, a difficult issue because we have patients that uh, don't like it. They say, oh my God, what is happening here? It really disturbs me. I don't want this. And you have people that say, oh, it's fine. I'm, I'm happy with that. So it's, it's not black and white. And I can tell you a little bit how, how we um, try it in a patient. So we're talking about patients that have severe bilateral vascular loss. And then you can define that with tests of calorics and head impulse tests, etc. Now, when it's severe, we ask, ask those patients, can you tell me how bad is your balance? And that's, of course, a subjective issue. But this is important because ultimately you want to help people to feel better. So we, I, I ask the patient, okay, imagine that the value that you had before you had this problem. So your balance was a 10, your personal best. And the worst thing you can imagine is zero. That means you can't walk, you can't stand. So where is your balance and immobility or mobility now? How do you score it? And what we see that the majority of patients with bilateral vascular loss, they score five or lower. So it's not zero, it's not generally not one, it's two, three, four, five, something like that. Okay. If they score six or seven, I can tell you that in most cases it's too good. So then the, the balance belt will not add enough for them. So you, you, you ask this question and you select the patient and say, okay, uh, you have a four. Okay, let's try the belt. So then the patient gets the belt and in the study that we did, several studies, we, we gave it for two hours in the hospital to try it out. Just walk around, go on the stairs, go down, up and down. And then you see that maybe 70% of these patients with bilateral loss and the scores of four or five, 70% said, wow, this is interesting. Something happens. I don't know precisely what, but I feel better. I said, do you want to try that at home? Yes, please give it to me. Okay. And there's 30% who says, I have no idea what it is, but it's completely nonsense. I don't know that this, this doesn't work for me. Okay. So then the patient takes the belt back home and he tries it out for two weeks. And then already after two hours and after two weeks, we see that the score in general, it goes up with about one and a half point on this subjective scale. And when they wear it for two months, then it's up to about two and a half, three points higher. And it stays for that for two years, three years. We have patients walking around with 10, 10, uh, 10 years. So there are not many people that then stop using the belt. It's about maybe another 10% that drops off. So you have 70% that choose it and you have 60% at the end, or a little bit more, 65% that ends up after two years wearing the belt daily. So it is a prosthesis and not a training device. So they have to wear it and if they take it off, then immediately the effect is away. So it's like a hearing aid to some extent. 
Can you tell our audience a little bit about what it looks like? Is it something that can be discreetly worn? Is it visible to another person? I mean, I was anticipating on that. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> For our audience so, that watch this so, on YouTube, he's holding up a balance belt. So it's a balance belt. I think this is uh, so. It's it's relatively simple. You you just put it around it like a normal belt, and then uh, it's like that. So this is in the front. And you wear it around your bangs. So, and then what you see here, it's a it's a big knot. That's where you know uh, there's the control system. And then you have in the belt, you have a lot of tactors. It weighs nothing. It works for one and a half day on the battery. So just uh, in the evening, you take it off and you 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 load it, you charge it. Um, I, I, you know, many people say it's okay. I'm happy with that. But you've also um, some very fashion girls in Paris <laughs> that say uh, to me, mm, mm, it's a little bit big buckle and I want to have this elegant dress and uh, can you make it uh, thinner? We're working on that, but uh, but uh, it's it's not bulky, it's not big, it's not heavy, it's relatively small, and it's very convenient. It's a lot so. more compact than I expected it or anticipated it to be. And to be, as a physical therapist, it's probably smaller than a gate belt, um, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. So yeah, I it, know a lot of, of people with uh, vestibular loss might be wearing gate belts around. Um, this is actually smaller than that, it looks. I, I want to tell you one, one more thing, you know, when I developed it, it was very difficult, you know, it went up and down, sometimes it didn't work and you have to find out the precise uh, type of stimulus, etc. Uh, and uh, what happened that at a certain moment I had, I think one prototype, only one belt, I could give it only to one patient to try it out for a month and then bring it back and try it with another patient. So, but what happened was when it started to work, then the patient came back after one month and said to me, I start crying, said, I don't want to give it back. Yeah. And that, that was for me a big motivation you know, to think, oh my God, it's possible. And uh, uh, because I'm a scientist, so I, I know that there's placebo effects and all these kinds of things. I'm not blind for that at all. But ultimately, it's only the patient that can tell you if it helps. So many people ask you, uh, what are the objective parameters that you can measure and that improve? And there are, there are absolutely. But ultimately, the uh, extrapolation of, you know, that you do some test in the laboratory and how that works out in daily life is a completely other story. So at a certain moment, I thought by myself, OK, I have a big lab. I can test many things uh, and I see improvements. But it's more important for me to know whether the patient, him, he or she, really has a benefit. And I was very happy that at a certain moment, patients called me, said, uh, Professor Kingma, uh, I need a smaller belt. I said, why that? I lost weight because I start to move again. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I'm not advertising, you know, <laughs> for belts. I'm not a commercial uh, organized person like that at all. But um, I'm, I'm the designer. I developed it for the patients and to, to give them a possibility to improve their quality of life. And Are there any other happy. factors that seem to predict, predict the patient finding it useful? Like, do you think they're... IQ or intelligence plays into it that they can handle processing the extra sensory information, or you don't see that to be related. Uh, I, I I was trying because uh, it would be fantastic if you just uh, you know uh, online can find out who are the best candidates, something like that. So, yeah. uh, especially when you live in a big country where, uh, but ultimately uh, by analyzing many things. I came to the conclusion that the best way to find it out was to provide the patient with a belt, yeah. explain how it works and use it for, let's say, two weeks. And already in two weeks, you know whether it will work. So I have a lot of these loan belts that people can just uh, try it. 
And I always say to them, well, you know, you don't need to like it for me. Eh? It's for you. If, you're, if you have benefit of it, I'm happy also. So it doesn't matter. You can br but bring it back if you think it's not useful because there are already many hearing aids in the cupboard. Uh, and we don't want to have the balance belts laying there besides the hearing aids. So just if it, if it helps you, okay. You can keep it, and uh, we're working on the reimbursement, etc. But uh, otherwise, give it back. And I think that that is a quite good strategy. It works pretty well. What were some of the specific objective measurements that you were measuring in the lab that saw improvement with using the utilizing the belt? Yeah, if you if you do just postural sway, if you put them on the platform, you can reduce it. Uh, what you see is that people. Um, some people start to sway more. And the reason for that is that they're not afraid anymore to sway. So it's, it's not, you know, a very direct connection. Some people start to sway less because they have better control and other people start to sway more because they allow themselves to sway more because they're not afraid anymore. So that makes it very difficult to correlate your objective measures with, you know, daily life activities. If you look at gait, uh, it's, it's pre predominantly what you see is that people start to walk more confident. So uh, they, can, they can walk also, you know, uh, in tandem walk and they can walk backwards something like that without being afraid to fall or something like that is there velocity change uh, yes the velocity changes you see that uh, when when people have a severe bilateral vessel loss that generally they they have a preferred speed that is relatively fast and uh, so and but when you ask them to slow down and to go in tandem you see the abnormalities right yeah. and that is changing by wearing the balance belt gotcha. Uh, do you think it has additive benefit for someone that also has peripheral neuropathy or does it have any usefulness for someone with peripheral neuropathy that doesn't have bilateral loss? If they have a really dense neuropathy and have no sense of... I do, I, I'm always very honest. Uh, you know, I, uh, I have no idea because you, 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 we developed the belt really for bilateral vascular loss. And uh, at a certain moment, I got also patients from neurology departments uh, with Parkinson, all these kinds of things. And we found out that until now, which is not a systematic scientific studies, it didn't help in these cases. So uh, we see that it works in some patients with triple PD. But again, we didn't do a systematic study, so we first tried to finish all the studies now, placebo-controlled crossover with the uh, bilateral vascular patients, and then the next step will be triple PD. Because with triple PD, there's something wrong with your perception of orientation in space, and, uh, and you can imagine that if you wear a balance belt, that it can restore you know, the programming in the brain by giving additional information. Whether that is true or not, you know, it's just an idea and something that we have to investigate. But um, my, my, at this moment, my, my approach is generally uh, try it. And if it helps you, then be happy. Amazing. Now, how much does something like this cost? Uh, it costs, uh, according to my knowledge, 4,250 euro. And uh, I think the belt will be available in six to 12 months in the, in the US. They're working on that. It's available all over Europe. And uh, now, there are now about 350 people walking around with the belts. Uh, and they wear them all day. So that is some, not something that they put on, for, on and off. And the interesting thing is, and that really makes me so happy, and enthusiastic that we see effect in small children that have a cochlear implant and have a severe bilateral loss and have motoric retardation and then you uh, you give them the belt and they start to walk close to normal mm -hmm. so 
immediately yeah, without you know a lot of training this is something that need to be explored more and more and you can imagine that uh, you know there are many children that they could get a cochlear implant and many of them the cochlear implant companies estimate that they about 50 percent or still 70 percent of them have a bilateral have a bilateral vestibular loss more or less and they see the motoric retardation so they contacted me and say is it maybe possible to combine it so that we have the the cochlear implant but at this moment the vestibular implant is not so far that we can use it in let's say a short time also for children that's much more difficult than in adults so maybe we can already try to help these children with the balance belt and how that it will work whatever again this is complete open question it can very well be that it it works like in the adults that it immediately works as a prosthesis but it can also be that it can support the rehab in these small children and the brain of course of these small children is very plastic can learn very fast so maybe they need it maybe for half a year and then they don't need the balance belt anymore because you know the whole organization of everything has been restored i have no idea but you can only find out by trying for our listeners that don't know how to convert euros to dollars um <laughs> the united states listeners four thousand euros equals about forty two hundred dollars so it's not that far off um ah. if you want to convert so you said what forty five hundred ish is that what you said so it'd be yeah. you'd probably be talking close to five thousand american dollars which I mean sounds costly, but when it comes to a prosthesis that changes quality of life and gives people back the ability to return to some sense of normalcy, but also safety, avoiding falls, even when it comes to utilizing in children, the fact that it can help with motor development potentially um, and help them, especially as they're growing, um, that seems right up there with regular costs of like a, pros a prosthetic you would need for something else, even just in comparison to hearing aids. Um, are they hoping that this will be something that will be reimbursable by insurance companies down the road? I, I can tell you something about that. Uh, we're working on that in the Netherlands and most likely the balance belt will be part of the basic health insurance in the Netherlands. Uh, it's not 100% sure, but I think we're busy on that also in the UK. Um, and I can tell you a little bit about the, the, the reaction of the health insurance companies in the Netherlands. They ask me how many people will start to use balance belt. I say, oh, I have no idea, you know, because the number of people with bilateral festival laws is not known. There are a lot of speculation about how, what is the prevalence or something like that. Nobody really knows it. Uh, so we don't know about how many people, but we are not talking about 10,000s of people. We're talking maybe about thousands or something like that. And for them, they said to me, oh my God, that's absolutely no issue. We're not going to talk about that because for them, it's such a small part of, of the, the, the healthcare cost that you're talking about. So just we can calculate that and it's just a part of the of the total total package so i i expect that uh, like you said the impact is very big but you're talking about a limited amount of people and the cost per belt is relatively small so i said it's not a big issue so i don't expect any big problems there it's the primary issue in the states is, is that it's not fda approved yet yeah correct? That is where we, I think, uh, what I learned from uh, the, the company that is uh, selling these belts and, and, and working on that, they told me that they expect that it will be six to 12 months before it will be FDA approved. Which in a government time in the United States probably means two to three years, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> Hopefully that's true. That it's <laughs> months. Um, a little jaded. I'm um, a very optimistic personality, so it's uh, you know I'm always I wake wake up in the morning and I'm I'm happy. Right. I've been waiting for this thing for 25 years, so what's another year or two really? Because <laughs> I started <laughs> reading about the research on this years and years ago, and it seemed to make so much you know logical sense, and I just 
you know, when I teach courses, I keep telling the clinicians, well, this should be on the market hopefully soon. And I think there was some effort in the Northeast. It might have been at Harvard by a Conrad Wall. Are you familiar with him? Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. I think I was referring to that. I said that the idea is completely it's not original at all. Uh, it comes what from to that? Did that just die on the vine or? Uh, well, I think there, there's one very important issue. All these devices that have been developed, you know, you have on the market also the Vertigards, these systems that are used for rehab for training. And um, the principle there is that you pay attention to uh, the movement and you use it as a biofeedback system to train yourself. And um, Conrad Wall worked on uh, getting the system as an ambulatory system because it worked in the laboratory. You can support uh, fiber biofeedback. You can help people to train uh, like, like you can do it with the, the balance master that you have visual feedback to control your, your, your thing, to learn to control it better. Um, and for some reason, I think it was not, you know, made to the to the end product, as far as I know. And uh, the very big difference in in the balance belt compared to all these fibro tactile feedback systems is that it is a constant stimulus that is almost unconscious. So you don't pay attention to it. You're not asking people to. Uh, to, to sway back when they feel more vibration. No, just start walking and the brain starts automatically to process the information. And that's a big difference because I talked with that uh, with Susan Whitney about that. And she said, yeah, we know that fibro tactile uh, feedback, when you start to use that in an ambulatory situation, it becomes an extra cognitive task. You can imagine that if you use the belt in a way that you walk and pay attention to every movement that you make, it drives you crazy. Yeah. But the mental setting, you know, that you, you have to explain it to the patient is important, and some people cannot do that. So they, they feel that the vibration is, is disturbing them. Mm. Not everybody can do it. Gotcha. Well, I think we hit all our questions on that. Uh, just looking at our list here. You guys have any questions? Any more questions on the balance belt? It's really great information, Dr. King. I, I think, yeah, that was... uh, sorry, I think well, the, 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 you, you asked the key questions were uh, for, for which people is it uh, shootable? Is it, will, will it work? And the answer is, I don't know precisely yet. I know it works in the bilateral patients and maybe in triple PD and who knows, and children maybe. We have to confirm that. And then the other key question is, how can I select the patient uh, in the right way? And then I said, yeah, best ask them, what is your mobility and imbalance? And it needs to be really bad. So if you ask me, what is the precise population? This is a very important issue and very difficult to understand. As I said, we do not really know how many people with severe bilateral loss are walking around. For some reason, they don't end up with the ENTs and the neurologists. If you ask that to them, many of them will say, I don't see so many of them. Most likely, because these patients don't complain about vertigo, they have a slowly decreasing vascular function and getting balance, imbalance as a major complaint and an image stabilization problem. They don't end up with the ENT or neurologist because they don't have this vertigo. They're not tested with the vascular system. I learned that in geriatric clinics and in full clinics, very often, at least in Denmark and the Netherlands, people are not tested for the vascular system at all. Mm -hmm. So these patients walk around, they are at risk for falling, but they don't end up with the ENT department, etc. So how can we get hold of them and try to help them? That, that is a crucial point. And I think that there are, that's what I see in the practice. There are patients with severe bilateral vascular loss and have no problem at all. They tell you, no, I'm fine. 
I can do everything. So you have people that have their own training program at home. They developed it very ingenious and they're very good. So I think there are many people that have a severe bilateral vessel problem, but they're helped very well with rehab and they are happy with their situation as it is. Yeah. But you have also these people like me, I'm, I'm an older person, but I still want to hike in the mountains and do crazy things. So I demand more. Mm -hmm. And this is the population that we're talking about. People that are older, have a poor imbalance, but don't want to give up. All right. So we're going to kind of shift course here. We're going to talk a little bit about, I think, a re another really interesting topic that Dr. King has done some work on, and that's vi vestibular perception. All right. And so one of the initial questions I had for him is, um, do you believe in subjective BPPV? And just for the audience, subjective BPV is kind of the term we use for patients who complain of positional type vertigo or dizziness. However, there's absolutely no nystagmus associated with it. So do you think there's instances where humans can perceive vestibular stimulation from their semicircular canal yet not express it in the way of eye movements? Or do you think that's physiologically not possible? <laughs> no, you gave the answer yourself already. I think the patient tells you that he feels something. And I think for me, that is always the golden standard. If a patient, you know, tells you that he has pain, then I cannot measure it. I cannot see it. I cannot feel it, but it's a very big reality for the patient. And I've seen many patients, not the majority, it's a smaller part that really have a very clear story about uh, positional vertigo and you don't see anything. And you have, of course, the two classes, you have people that report it and that you say, maybe I'm not seeing the patient at the right moment. So we all know that when you start to move during the day, that, you know, the, 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 the clots, the materials can run all over your labyrinths and then you do the test and you don't see any clear effect anymore. It's like a Christmas ball that you move all the time and then, yeah, you say, where is it precisely? No, it's everywhere. Um, so then uh, the key question is to see the patient at the right moment, maybe in the early in the morning, or there are even uh, physiotherapists in, uh, in Sweden that use a, a maneuver that they load the vestibular system, the canal. So they, they position the patient in a certain position to make sure that all the materials go in one direction. And then they do the diagnostic test and they see the nystagmus. So that's one category. You, it's there, but you don't see it at the right moment. But there are also patients that you can try to do it all the time and you don't see anything. So we give them a small um, special device lens that they can put on the uh, mobile phone. And as soon as they have the, 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 the problem, they can make a recording at home so that you try to catch them when they are at home. And then there has again, a number of patients that we see, yes, you have the nystagmus and the vertigo. So you can make the diagnosis, but there's also again, this, this other group that also with this device doesn't show anything. Now, if you, if you look at, uh, you know, the, the vestibular system, then I think it's absolutely clear that you can induce a sensation of rotation without nystagmus. The, the, the threshold, you know, for uh, nystagmus and the threshold for vestibular perce perception of rotation are not the same. And they're even in the past, and I talk about really 70 years ago, there were people using that difference as some kind of indicator for Meniere disease or something like that. So they were measuring how long is your perception of rotation versus the nystagmus. And we see that also in the caloric test, that's a test with water in the ears, as you, as you know, then you can see that there are patients that still have the nystagmus and don't feel any rotation and the other way around. Mm -hmm. So there's not a hundred percent correlation between them. This is, this is my own ignorance, but do we 
have an explanation as to why patients' perception to vestibular stimuli is so different. Um, for example, I can have somebody with posterior canal, BP and BV, canal uh, you can lay them back, their eyeball can be, you know, rolling out of their head and they have uh, just a sense of imbalance or they just feel a little funny. And then I can roll, I can lean somebody back and I can get a very tight and very um, small level of nystagmus. And that person feels like they're flying off the face of the earth. Do we know why there's so much variability, which makes us so subjective from patient to patient? The answer is, I don't know. I can only speculate about it. But I think it's a similar kind of question is why are some people very easily motion sick and other people not. Yeah. We know that a patient with, for example, vestibular migraine, they have a higher sensitivity for motion sickness and things like that. But there are huge differences. There are people that going into a roller coaster say, wow, let's make fun. And the other people said, I'm not going to. And there are all kinds of factors uh, that have, have mentioned in the past, anxiety, you know, uh, if you have experienced it one time, then the next time you're more sensitive for, for getting sick. But in depth, when you go into it, there, there is not a very, very clear explanation for that. We only know that there are big differences. And uh, look at the, uh, for example, the caloric test. If you look at how much variability within normative data there are, it's 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 terrible because it makes the uh, sensitivity of our uh, and specificity of our test uh, not so very good. But it's a reality, so um, it's like that. We are very different. Uh, if you ask me, can you explain that to some extent? I think to to some extent, um, if you look at hearing and if, if you look at, at vision, you know, we are so much very clear aware of what we can expect when, you know, there is a sound. So it's something that is, we know also when something goes wrong with our hearing, it takes time before you notice it, it needs to go over a certain threshold. Uh, but then you say, hey, there's something wrong with my ear. And you can also compare left and right. So you have this conscious comparison that you can make. With your eyes, the same story. But the vestibular system is a completely different thing. It works on the background. Uh, you're hardly aware. If you go on the street and you ask people, how are your labyrinths today? <laughs> they look at you, my labyrinths, what do you mean? Uh, yeah, those bands organs. The, the, the vast majority of the people don't know that they have balance organs. Abby and so, Danny might actually ask people that occasionally, so be careful. People, they, they <laughs> I was just thinking that needs to be a new t-shirt line uh, that we need to start providing. How, How are you laughing? <laughs> no, but, but, but this is, for me, it's, it's very important because it means that if you have a problem in your vision, if you have a problem in your balance, people don't think about their balance organs. So it's, it's a more, more subtle uh, perception and your perception of motion and orientation is also something that you generally are not engaged with. You're not aware of that you're doing that all the time. You need it for your posture control and everything and for your image stabilization. It goes completely automatic. It's like your, your heart that is beating all the time. But you're not aware. So I think the perception of motion uh, is something where you really need to ask attention for. And then I come back to all the fantastic work that has been done by uh, Dan Merfield and colleagues about, you know, trying to measure the threshold of movement perception and tilt perception. And we, we did the same. It was also one of my dreams to be able to make a vestibulogram like audiogram. Can you still feel motion? We managed to do that. And then Merfield also different ways, but we learned a lot from that. And one of the things is also that we learned is that it's very different from person to person, the perceptive level of when you can feel some 
rotation, some tilt, etc. And um, you really need to ask a person when he sits on a chair or whatever, can you please concentrate on feeling the movement? And then you see that his thresholds become lower and lower and lower. So I find this also interesting because I think that in the realm of vestibular research, it gets harder and harder to try to answer questions because it's getting, it's very difficult to quantify and to objectively measure something that is so individualized from person to person. And I just, I think that makes it that much cooler um, when it comes to looking at the whole field of vestibular. Danny, I wanted to yeah. mention, uh, there was a recent study that looked at, I was looking it up here because I had to, couldn't rely on my recall, but basically they were looking at a group of individuals with traumatic brain injury that had BPPV with agnosia. In other words, weren't complaining of dizziness despite the presence of a positive Dix Hall Pike. And they felt like a common area of um, a common area of lesion in their brain was the inferior longitudinal fasciculus and the right temporal lobe. So that's where they kind of felt like possibly this agnosia might be localized to. And we do know that agnosia is more common with aged brains and or brain injury. So that might provide some insight into like localization of where that may come from. Just one other comment on this topic. Like when I was new into this long ago, I was very confused. I'd have patients come to me that had a caloric test done. And I look at their test results and they had nice responses on both sides, you know, like 20 degrees per second of nystagmus from each year with warm and colds. And you can see the strip that there was impressive nystagmus during the test and you'd ask the patient how did you feel when you had that test done and oh, i didn't feel anything <laughs> i didn't feel a thing at all and i was sitting there thinking well, was the test done right and but then i started actually doing calorics occasionally at our center and i would say one in five patients you do calorics on even in those that are getting responses and they have no perception at all that it's occurring um you know the test is done in the dark they can't see you know, they can't appreciate the oscillopsy when they're in the dark and they have just no perception of anything occurring during the caloric test, even when they have responses in many cases. So I just didn't want others to be confused by that. Don't go by, go by the numbers <laughs> and don't be surprised. And, and, the, and, and the other way around, you have patients that have a very small response and they get very, very dizzy Absolutely. and nausea. Yep. And uh, a long time ago, uh, people were also trying to uh, correlate, for example, hyperventilation with uh, caloric and rotary chair testing. And the outcome of these studies was that if you ask a person to hyperventilate, a normal healthy person that never hyperventilates, and you ask him to hyperventilate during the caloric test or during a rotary chair test, his responses increases enormously. Mm. So the hyperactivity in the caloric test doesn't prove that a person is a chronic hyperventilant. It only can tell you that maybe the patient at that moment was hyperventilating for whatever reason, mm. but it doesn't prove. So it shows you that there are so many factors. And uh, uh, yeah, I personally, you know, I was always uh, flabbergasted by all these new developments in diagnostic tests, especially when you talk about the otolith system, the utriculus and succulus, the most fundamental part basically of our vessel assistant that detects where gravity is. And uh, I thought, oh, it would be so nice if we could measure that. And through the years, many people have invented all kinds of fantastic diagnostic tools, rotary chairs with linear accelerators, centrifuges, etc. Ultimately, um, the sensitivity of these tests were not so promising, not so good. Uh, we have all the equipment in Maastricht, so we can do everything. But um, my aim was always to get some kind of test that everybody could use. And that's what I'm talking about thresholds. We have a, a hexapod that costs you 250,000 euro and you can measure thresholds. But the bad news is, of course, that nobody is going to buy a hexapod to measure thresholds like an audiometer 
in a normal clinical practice. So can we developing develop something that makes it possible for normal clinical practices to measure these things in, in people so that it becomes available for everybody and that we have a better idea about what functions in a patient, the canals, the utericles and suckler systems, because I'm not so happy at this moment with all the tests that are available. Agree. A simple thing I've been doing lately that I just think can be applicable to everybody is when I have patients that have like, you have patients that have an overtly positive head impulse test. They don't need a video head impulse test, but I have some patients sometimes that I do a head impulse test and I'm like, is that a little off on the left or not? It's not sure. Or the history implies that they may have hypofunction, but the head impulse isn't real clear. I have them hold up their cell phone right in front of them and I go behind them and do the head impulse test. And then I replay yeah. it on, it's super it's easy to do. I just replay it in slow motion and you can often see what well, you couldn't see with your naked eye at real speed. If you play the head impulse test at 0.25 speed on your phone, you're like, oh yeah, it is slipping to the left. And that's that literally takes, I don't know, three or four minutes of effort to do. Um, for those that don't have access to video head impulse testing, that might be a, a useful substitute is record, have yeah. the patient hold the phone right in front of their mug, have their eyes on the camera, do your head impulse test behind them, and then just replay it in slow motion at 0.25 speed. And you can often see, you can see the corrective saccade much better. I love that idea. <laughs> I'm, I'm teaching that oh. <laughs> and uh, to people. I give workshops on it and uh, using the iPhone and I can send you some slides about it. Um, and I use it as a uh, screening tool to identify severe bilateral vascular loss. And very recently I did that in a, in a, in a home for dementia patients. Uh, we were at risk to fall and to use the mobile phone, like you said, exactly like that. There are basically two methods. You can do it like you said, that you, you ask the patient to hold it him or herself and you stand behind the patient. And as long as they don't have a <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, 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 the point is, of course, the light, you need to have nice light. Mm -hmm. So uh, nowadays we have more LED lamps, so everything is more, more perfect. And the other technique that is a little bit more sensitive is that you buy a flogging lamp and you have the camera so in front with a perfect flogging illumination costs you $40. And I can show you the images that you think, my God, this is amazing because you, you can make a, a slow motion of 240 Hertz. So that's about almost uh, eight times uh, slower than normal. And you see everything. You see everything. Would that be like so, the ring lights that you see people yes, using? The for, ring okay, lights, yes. so we can just use like the. Oh, this is. Great. I make a ring. I make a ring light. I can send you the slides. You can see it. So then you have the ring light, and you will see the eyes. You know, it's amazing. So what we are doing now is we put also uh, with an eyeliner. We put an, a black dot on the head. So now in the image you can see the eye movement and the head movement. And so we're now working on an app to analyze precisely the eye and head movement so that you e can even quantify it. But for severe bilateral loss, uh, you can identify that like you did, Jeff, with this simple test. It works perfectly. Do you think, uh, this is probably hard to answer, but what would you, what would you say the comparative sensitivity is? With we're measuring that now. <laughs> of what I just talked about. Are you losing much? Are I you think, gaining much? By I think I think uh, there are m m most likely many people in the world are working on this uh, because it's so 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 obvious. You know that the mobile phones are so fantastic. You can use it for yeah. this uh, purpose. We're not dealing with waveforms and goggles slipping. And <laughs> no, but that, that is that is because there is there are we have the two systems from uh, Natus and Interacoustics that are competing. These are the the headheld systems, and we have the French system, the 
uh, synopsis that is a camera looking at the distance where you don't have all these issues about uh, you know uh, head uh, slippage of the the goggles etc so but there are some issues about how things are calculated in all these devices so yeah. um, without going into depth of that uh, i think the mobile phone will really be a, a breakthrough because it's available for many people i i teach in many countries all over the world where people simply don't have the money for buying these these devices if i come in in romania for example i have a master class of i was 150 people and i asked them how many people have the video head impulse test three yeah so that's that's the re reality but if you could use your like you said your mobile phone to overcome the problem okay maybe it's not so sensitive exactly as the devices but that's what we are now testing so in all our patients in the geriatric department in alborg we do the video head impulse test and we do the mobile head impulse test mm. and we are comparing them Great. So I you're feel so bad for my husband, test. who's going to be subjective to all this testing tonight. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we can wrap up there. We really appreciate all your insight and your wisdom and your way of expressing it to us. Um, and we hope to have you on again. Another big area of Dr. Kingma's research has been in the area of vestibular implants, which I think is really, really interesting also. So we will try to see if we can get them on again to discuss, to tackle that topic on another episode, if everybody's agreeable. I am oh, dying. We can so. we yeah. can spend a whole hour. I am dying to dig into that topic ever since I first heard about those trials up at Johns Hopkins and seeing the research coming out on that. So we will we double will... your pay for the next episode. <laughs> so we'll go two times zero to see. So it, um, for the audience to know, Dr. Kingma donated his time to do this as we all do. Um, so. We really thank him for being willing to um, take the time to share this information at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> so appreciative. Thank you so much. And we look forward to um, talking again soon. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Kingla. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. Until next time. I, I tell you a little bit about my background and whether you use it or not, I, I don't care. It's not, a, you know, I, I come from a music family. And uh, so my father was a violin player and I played the oboe. And I was thinking that I would go to the conservatory to do music. But when I was 17, I thought by myself, I'm not good enough. So don't do that. That will be a disaster. And I think that was a very good decision. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I went because I was really, uh, you know, didn't know what to do, you know, with 70 years, what can you do? What do you know? So I, I decided to go to study history of arts in Paris. Mm -hmm. So I did my master's in history of arts, but when I finished it, I thought by myself, that's not what I really want to do in daily life. So my best friend was studying biology in Amsterdam. So I thought by myself, if he likes it, I will like it too. So I went to Amsterdam and then um, I got interested in the brain. And I thought by myself, maybe I should also combine it with physics. Mm -hmm. Then I have more possibilities in developing uh, tools mm -hmm. to measure things, etc. So then I, I, so I started biology and physics and uh, in my master's period, I was um, uh, doing research in the retina of the goldfish of all animals. But you know, the, the, the goldfish has a retina that is very similar to that of humans. Mm -hmm. so, the, so you learn a lot from that by uh, how the visual system in humans work. And I was flabbergasted by this sensory physiology. I loved that I did electrophysiology, things like that. But at the same time, I used my physics background to model, you know, the things that I was doing to understand how signal processing was going on, etc. Then there was a crisis at the university and I could not stay there. They wanted to have me there, but as a PhD, but it was, there was no money. So the professor called another professor we knew uh, was loaded with money for research and uh, he said you know this 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 herman kingman he's one of my best students but also 
he takes care of our goldfishes to earn some extra money. And since he takes care, no fish died anymore. <laughs> so this so this is a good guy. <laughs> I average so, like three days when I bring him home from a carnival. So <laughs> I was gonna say that is not an easy thing to do. So yeah, but it was to be very honest, you know, the, I had a simple trick. When there was a problem with the fish, I called the veterinary department of the university and I said, Can I bring a fish and you tell me what is wrong and what I should do? And uh, that's how I managed because I had no idea about fishes. I just so thought you would have bought some more to replace the ones that died. <laughs> no. Anyway, that was that was my my start. Really, you know, fascination about the sensory physiology. But because I I had to move to another department, I I went to uh, this biophysics where I did um, quantum physics, experimental quantum physics in photosynthesis. So it was absolutely not my love. And every day I still remember I was on the bike going, you know, to the to the university. Oh, I have to finish this, I have to finish. Mm -hmm. But I learned a lot there. So because there was so much technology and background, so and experimental physics. So I had this broad background, and then in Maastricht they were looking for some kind of biologist or physicist with an interest in the sensory physiology to set up the vestibular department in the new academic hospital. Ah, and that's so, how you and at that moment, really too, I didn't know that there was a balance organ at all, mm -hmm. which which is really very interesting if you realize yourself that it's still. You know, and, and secondary school and all the schools, medical school, you know, the balance system is not, you know, teached as good as the hearing and the vision, etc. So it was not a surprise. So and then I started to set up the whole department there. I studied vestibular medicine. So I, I started to see patients. So then you have the nice combination that you have on one hand, you see the patients, you see the problem. And you have a technical background that helps you to maybe come up with all kinds of ideas that could help in terms of better diagnostics, but also developing the, the, the treatment options like the balance belt and the, uh, the vessel implant. Yeah. So that's the story. So it's completely, you know, some kind of seesaw road towards uh, there. And afterwards, I'm extremely happy that I came there uh, because, uh, you know, I, I loved it. We, you can tell. <laughs> you can tell when you lecture that you love it. Yeah. Yes, I absolutely. Love it. And I think that's a great thing to share with our audience, by the way, that recap on how you got into the vestibular world, and then they'll know a little bit more about who they're hearing from. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. The content of this podcast is based on general knowledge and information available up until the recording of this specific episode. Medical knowledge and practices may evolve over time and new information may emerge that could change the understanding or treatment of vestibular dysfunction. It is important to consult a qualified healthcare professional for the most up-to-date and personalized advice. The information provided in this podcast is meant to complement, not replace, the relationship that exists between a patient and their healthcare provider. It is intended to empower patients with knowledge about vestibular dysfunction and its management, but individual cases may vary and treatment approaches should be tailored to each patient's unique circumstances. By listening to this podcast, you acknowledge and agree to the terms of this medical disclaimer. The organizers, presenters, and creators of this podcast are not liable for any actions or decisions taken by individuals based on the information presented herein. Always consult with a qualified healthcare provider for medical advice and treatment.